Chapter 11. I had often wondered what old Dan would do if little Anne got into some kind of predicament. One night, I got my answer. For several days, a northern blizzard had been blowing. It was a bad one. The temperature dropped down to 10 below. The storm started with a slow, cold drizzle and then sleet. When the wind started blowing, everything froze, leaving the ground as slick as glass. Trapped indoors, I was as nervous as a fish out of water. I told Mama I guessed it was just going to storm all winter. She laughed and said, I don't think it will, but it does look like it'll last for a while. She ruffled my hair and kissed me between the eyes. This did rile me up. I didn't like to be kissed like that. It seemed that I could practically rub my skin off and still feel it all wet and sticky and kind of burning. Sometime on the fifth night, the storm blew itself out and it snowed about three inches. The next morning, I went out to my doghouse. Scraping the snow away from the two-way door, I stuck my head in. It was as warm as an oven. I got my face washed all over by little Ann. Old Dan's tail thumped in, uh, out of tune on the wall. I told them to be ready because we were going hunting that night. I knew the old ringtails would be hungry and stirring for they had been dinned up during the storm. That evening, as I was leaving the house, Papa said, Billy, be careful tonight. It slicked down under the snow and it would be easy to twist an ankle or break a leg. I told him I would and that I wasn't going far, just down the back of our fields in the bottoms. Well, anyway, he said, be careful. There's no, there'll be no moon tonight and you're going to see some fog next to the river. Walking through the fields, I saw my father was right about it being slick and dark. Several times I slipped and sat down. I couldn't see anything beyond the glow of my lantern, but I wasn't worried. My light was a good one and Mama had insisted that I make my make two little leather pouches to cover the blades of my axe. Just before I reached the timber, old Dan shook the snow from the underbrush with his deep voice. I stopped and listened. He bawled again. The deep bass tones rolled around under the tall sycamores, tore their way out of the thick timber and traveled over the fields and slammed up against the foothills. They seemed to break up and die away in the mountains. Old Dan was working the trail slowly and I knew why. He would never line out until little Anne was running by his side. I thought she would never get there. When she did, her beautiful voice made the blood pound in my temples. I felt the excitement of the hunt as it ate its way into my body. Taking a deep breath, I reared back and whooped as loud as I could. The coon ran up river for, the, for a way and then, cutting out of the bottoms, he headed for the mountains. I stood and listened until their voices went out, here, went out of hearing. Slipping and sliding, I started in the direction I had last heard them. About halfway to the foothills, I heard them coming back. Somewhere in the rugged mountains, the coon had turned and headed toward the river. It was about time for him to play out a few tricks, and I was wondering what he would do. I knew it would be hard for him to hide his trail with snow on the ground, and I realized later that the small old coon knew this too. As the voices of my dogs grew louder, I could tell that they were coming straight toward me. Once I started to bl blow out my lantern, thinking that maybe I could see them when they crossed our field, but I realized I didn't stand a chance of seeing the race in the skunk black night. Down out of the mountains they brought him, singing his hound dog song on his heels. The coon must have scented me or seen my lantern. He cut to my right and ran between our house and me. I heard, father, I heard screaming and yelling from my sisters. My father started whooping. I knew my whole family was out on the porch listening to the beautiful voices of my red, little red hounds. I felt as tall as the tallest sycamore on the riverbank. I yelled as loud as I could. Again, I heard the squealing of my sisters and the shouts of my father, the deep woos of old Dan and the sharp ahs of little Ann bored a hole into the inky black night. The vibrations rolled and quivered in the icy silence. The coon was heading for the river and I could tell my dogs were crowding him, and I wondered if he'd make it to the water. I was hoping he wouldn't, for I didn't want to wade into the cold water unless I had to, had to do it. I figured the old smart coon had a reason for turning and coming back to the river, and wondered what trick he had in mind. I remembered something my grandfather had told me. He said, Never underestimate the cunning of an old river coon. When the nights are dark and the ground is frozen and slick, they can pull some mean tricks on a hound. Sometimes the tricks can be fatal. I was halfway through the fog-covered bottoms when the voices of my dogs stopped. I stood still, waited, and listened. 
A cold silence settled over the bottoms. I could hear the snap and crack of sap foot frozen limbs. From far back in the flinty hills, the long, lonesome howl of a timber wolf floated down in the silent night. Across the river, I heard a cow moo. I knew the sound was coming from the Lowry place. Not being able to hear the voices of my dogs gave me an uncomfortable feeling. I whooped and waited for one of them to bawl. As I stood waiting, I realized something was different in the bottoms. Something was missing. I wasn't worried about my dogs. I figured that a coon had pulled some trick, and sooner or later they would unravel the trail. But the feeling that something was not just not right had worried me. I whooped several times, but still could get no answer. Stumbling, slipping, and sliding, I started on. Reaching the river, I saw it was frozen over. I realized what my strange, uneasy feeling was. I had not been able to hear the sound of the water. As I stood listening, I heard a gurgling out in the middle of the stream. The river wasn't frozen all the way across. The still eddy waters next to the banks had frozen, but out in the middle where the current was swift, the water was running, leaving a trough in the ice pack. The gurgling sound I had heard was the swift current as it sucked its way through the channel. The last time I had heard my dogs, they were downstream from me. I walked on, listening. I hadn't gone far when I heard old Dan. What I heard froze in the blood of my veins. He wasn't bawling on a trail or giving the tree bark. It was one long, continuous cry. In his deep voice, there seemed to be a pleading cry for help. Scared, worried, and with my heart beating like a churn dasher, I started toward the sound. I almost passed him, but with another cry, he had let me know where he was. He was out on the ice pack. I couldn't see him for the fog. I called to him, and he answered with a low whine. I called his Again, I called his name. This time, he came to me. He wasn't the same dog. His tail was between his legs, and his head was bowed down. But He stopped at about seven feet from me. Sitting down on the ice, he raised his head and howled the most mournful cry I'd ever heard. Turning around, he trotted back on the ice and disappeared in the fog. I knew something had happened to little Anne. I called her name. She answered with a pleading cry. Although I couldn't see her, I guessed what had happened. The, goon ha the coon had led them to the river. Running out on the ice, he had leaped across the trough. My dogs, hot on the trail, had followed. Old Dan, a more powerful dog than little Anne, had made his leap. Little Anne had not made it. Her small feet had probably slipped on the slick ice, and she had fallen into the icy waters. Old Dan, seeing the fate of his little friend, had quit the chase and come back to help her. The smart old coon had pulled his trick, and it a deadly one it was. I had to do something. She would never be able to get out by herself. It was only a matter of time until her body would be paralyzed by the freezing water. Laying my axe down, I held my lantern out in front of me and stepped out on the ice. It started cracking and popping. I jumped back to the bank. Although it was thick enough to hold the light weight of my dogs, it would never hold me. Little Anne started whining and begging for help. I went to pe all to pieces and started crying. Something had to be done and done quickly or my little dog was lost. I thought of running home for a rope or for my father, but I knew she couldn't last until I got back. I was desperate. It was impossible for me to swim in the freezing water. I wouldn't last it for a minute. She cried again, begging for the one thing I couldn't give her. Help. I thought, if I could only see her, maybe I could figure out some way to help. Looking at my lantern gave me an idea. I ran up to the bank about 30 feet, turned and looked back. I could see the light, not well, but enough for what I had in mind. I grabbed my lantern and axe and ran for the bottoms. As I, as I was looking for a stand of wild cane, after what seemed like ages, I found it. With the longest one I could find, I hurried back. After it was trimmed and the, and the limber end cut off, I hung the lantern by the handle and on, on the end of it and started easing it out onto, on the ice. I saw old Dan first. He was sitting close to the edge of the trough, looking down. Then I saw her. I groaned at her plight. All I could see was her head and her small front paws. Her claws were spread out and digging into the ice. She knew that if she ever lost that hold, she was gone. Old Dan raised his head and howled. Hound though he was, he knew it was the end of the trail for his little pal. I wanted to get my light as close to little Anne as I could, but my pole was a good eight feet short. Setting the lantern down, I eased the pole from under the handle. I thought, I'm no better off than I was before. In fact, I'm worse off. 
Now I can see when the end comes. Little Ann cried again. I saw her claws slip on the ice. Her body settled lower in the water. Old Dan howled and started fidgeting. He knew the end was cl close. I didn't exactly know when I started out toward my dog. I'd taken only two steps when the ice broke. I twisted my body and fell toward the bank. Just as my hand closed on the root, I thought my feet should touch the bottom, but I wasn't sure. As I pulled myself out, I felt a numbing cold creep over my legs. It looked so hopeless. There didn't seem to be any way I could save her. At the edge of the water stood a large sycamore. I got behind it, anything to blot out that heartbreaking scene. Little Anne, thinking I had deserted her, started crying. I couldn't stand it. I opened my mouth to call old Dan. I wanted to tell him to come on, and we'd go home as there was nothing we could do. The words just wouldn't come out. I couldn't utter a sound. I lay my face against the icy cold bark of the sycamore. I thought of the prayer I had said when I had asked God to help me to get two hound pups. I knew I knelt down and sobbed out a prayer. I asked for a miracle which would save the life of my little dog. I promised all the things that a young boy could if only he would help me. Still saying my prayer and making promises, I heard a sharp metallic sound. I jumped up and stepped away from the tree. I was sure the noise I had heard was made by a rattling chain on the front end of the boat. I shouted as loud as I could. Over here I need help. My dog is drowning. I waited for an answer. All I could hear were the cries of little Anne. Again I hollered, Over here, over on the bank, can you see my light? I need help, please hurry. I held my breath waiting for an answering shout. I shivered from the freezing cold in my wet shoes and overalls. The str a straining silence settled over the river. A feathery rustle swished by in the blackness. A flock of low-flying ducks had been disturbed by my loud shouts. I strained my ears for some sound. Now and then I could hear the lapping slap of the ice-cold water as it swirled its way through the trough. I glanced to little Anne. She was still holding on, but I saw her paws were almost at the edge. I knew her time was short. I couldn't figure out what I had heard. The sound was made by metal striking metal, but what was it? What could have caused it? I looked at my axe. It couldn't have been it couldn't have made the sound as it was too close to me. The noise had come from out in the river. When I looked at my lantern, I knew that it had made the strange sound. I had left the handle standing straight up when I had taken the pole away. Now it was down. For some unknown reason, the stiff wire handle had twisted in the sockets and dropped. As it had fallen, it struck the metal frame, making the sharp metallic sound I had heard. As I stared at the yellow glow of my light, the last bit of hope faded away. I closed my eyes, intending to pray again for the help I so desperately needed. Then, like a blinding red flash, a mess the message of the lantern bored its way into my brain. There was my miracle. There was a way to save my little dog. And the metallic sound I had heard were my instructions. They were so plain I couldn't help but understand them. The bright yellow flame started flickering and dancing. It seemed to be saying, hurry, you know what to do.